very good morning to you. Thank you for staying with us on the AM show as we dig into our big stories. And today we're going to be talking about the Gold for Oil program, a policy by our government to buy oil products with gold. Now, a government says the move is meant to tackle the dwindling foreign currency reserves, coupled with a demand for dollars by oil importers. Now, what exactly will the modalities be and how sustainable is this measure? We discuss this also together with matters arising from the 2023 budget presentation. Uh, we're joined by our guests shortly. We'll be interacting with uh, Dr. Steve Mantea, formerly head of the Public Interest and Accountability uh, Committee. He has been gracious enough, uh, though on very short notice, to join us uh, this morning. Doc, a very good morning to you. Good morning. And um, good morning to your viewers. Great. We'll also be joined by Dr. Aka shortly and Dr. Abu Sakara Foster of the National Interest Movement. But let me start with you. I know you're raring to go when it comes to the bit about gold for oil. But I would like to start from what the 2023 budget had to share with us on the e-levy, on VAT, on uh, tax waivers for foreign entities, on myriad aspects of our society. LEAP, for example, is going to get uh, more beneficiaries because more funding is going to go there. That was touted by Majority Leader Oseiche Mensa Bonsu. But on the minority side, they said this, some of the policy measures would impose a lot of hardship on the ordinary Ghanaian. What are your brief takeaways from Budget 2023? Hello, Doc? Is that direct? Yes, please. Oh, yes. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Um, you know, the expectations that um, I had um, ahead of the budget reading, I, I, I dare say, was not fully met. Okay. Um, we know times are hard. And, and in many countries of the world, there's been some ways in which government has been seeking to assist in some countries like the U.S., there have been payouts to families and the rest. And so the least we could do for our people in, in, in these difficult times would be not to increase taxes, especially um, when it comes to BAT, because BAT is a regressive tax. Uh, both the rich and the poor pay the same uh, percentage, and therefore it makes the poor poorer in terms of the nominal share of their income that goes into VAT. And, and so uh, in hard times like this, you wouldn't want to overburden the poor with an increase in VAT. Of course, the government attempted to balance this with a reduction in the uh, e-levy. But again, taking away the threshold, again, hits the poor very hard. Uh, and so you find that the, 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 the poor in society are the ones that are going to bear the brunt uh, of, um, of these new tax policy measures. And um, what government would have done really would have been to target the high income earners. And, and so you, if there's a need to impose any tax at all, then of course you want to target luxury goods. And, and, and to the extent that VAT in this country extends even to food items, I don't think Uh, for protection for citizens. Right. So we'll try to sort out uh, that uh, connection with uh, Dr. Manteo. Uh, I don't know whether we have your sound back now. We lost a bit of what you said. P please please yeah, go so ahead. I'm, I'm saying that to the extent that we have, in this country, VAT covers food items. Um, I, I do not think that increasing VAT actually takes care of of the needs and the need to protect the poor in society. We could have done better. We could have done better. Uh, so so do, you, do you feel this will compound the, the situation when it comes to the poorest of the poor? We've been battered by COVID-19 and now the Russo-Ukrainian war, which has spawned part of what we are seeing. And now VAT has been increased by 2.5 percentage points uh, the the e-levy has gone down to 1%, but the threshold of 100 CDs is, is gone. How will all of that add to the mix when it comes to the poorest of the poor? I heard uh, Professor Bokman share with me recently that about 14 million Ghanaians plus are multidimensionally poor. 
on that angle, what, what do you have to say? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, um, because, you know, VAT runs through the entire economy. And so um, I'm, I'm definitely is going to hit the poor very hard. But let me also note that government's attempts to take cognizance of that uh, by increasing the number of LEAP beneficiaries. But the amounts that are paid out to LEAP beneficiary in itself is not something that can keep them um, ab ab above um, the cost of living. And so definitely many of our people are going to live below the poverty line, even, in re even those receiving some help in the form of LEAP uh, from, from, from government. Just hold for me, uh, Dr. Manteo. Let me also bring in Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. Doc, uh, thank you so much for joining us. He, of course, is uh, founder of the National Interest Movement. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sakara, for joining the conversation. Well, yeah. Uh, what Hello, Dr. Sakara. I mean, my keeper, I'm a lion there, no? All right, so we'll try to get the connection to uh, Dr. Abu. Uh, Sakara, and he'll share his thoughts with us. Doc, can you hear me now, Dr. Sakara? You would have to unmute. Yes, I am unmuted. Great, great. I can hear you now. Uh, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> good to have you join the conversation this morning. I hope you're well. Thank you very much, and good morning to Dr. S uh, to Steve Manteo as well. Great. I was just picking Dr. Manteo's thoughts on budget 2023 and the different dynamics from VAT to um, LEAP to uh, the e-levy to a cessation of employment, basically, when it comes to the civil service from January 2023. Myriad aspects we can, we can look at. And now, uh, shortly, we'll be talking about gold for oil. But let's, let's stay that subject for now. What do you make of budget 2023? Is it going to alleviate the, 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 the burden, especially of the poorest of the poor, now that we know over 14 million Ghanaians are multidimensionally poor? How will this impact us, good or bad? Well, uh, I think the budget has elements of an old Clint Eastwood movie, I saw, called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Ah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the good thing... The good thing about it is that we have woken up to the reality of the situation we're in. I don't know whether it's the full reality of the situation we're in, because some of the measures uh, that are being taken, uh, their quantitative impacts will not be sufficient to redress the magnitude of the problem that uh, uh, we are faced with. I think Dr. Manteo alluded to the fact that Whereas some changes had been made in certain areas, they were not enough to cover, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, intended benefits on the other side. And I think that from a quant quant quantitative point of view, that is essentially what it is. We're still dealing with the symptoms of what afflicts us in terms of an economic crisis born out of over expenditure of government. Uh, born out of excessive borrowing and a heavy debt uh, burden, and then also born out of any, a, a refusal to accept the aspects of mismanagement that continue to drag us deeper into the deep waters. And I'm speaking about this not with respect to one administration, but across administrations. But of course, we are particularly concerned with this one, because it is this budget that we are talking about. And I'll explain uh, what I mean. Uh, I think the attempts to cut, uh, reduce waste, and trim government are good in the sense that mm -hmm. it tells us that at last we're waking up to the fact that you cannot have 120 ministers, 1,000 staffers, uh, V8s for so many people, and then chief uh, chief executive emoluments, um, et cetera. You can't have all those things for a country that has our income and the size of our country. You can't. It's as simple as that. So at some stage, you have to wake up to the reality and make the fundamental adjustments. That is one point. The other aspect of it is that you, even with all the good intention in the world, you cannot borrow a lot of money and spend it on aspects of services 
that are not directly in the growth areas of the economy like production and manufacturing. Because it's from the growth of the production and manufacturing that you get the internal rates of return in order to be able to pay for the loans. But if you spend it on the service aspects, health, education, it's not that those things are bad, but they're long term and they don't bring back the returns of investment as quickly as you want it to be able to pay for the loan. And therefore, the deficit strangles you. So we've got to correct that fundamentally as well and reduce the proportion in which we spend on those relative to what we are spending in the growth areas. The other good aspect that I want to mention before I go on to the others is the intention of investing in these agro-industrial areas, et cetera, and areas of growth, et cetera. But when you look at the quantum amounts that are being discussed about those investments, they're very tiny. You know, uh, you cannot then turn only to taxation to raise the revenue you need, because that is now turning into a scenario of squeezing blood out of a stone. Because even before we arrived at this point, the private sector were already complaining <laughs> of, uh, you know, overburdensome of taxes uh, and, you know, et cetera, and also even individuals. So if you're now deepening uh, the tax burden, uh, then people will rightly ask, oh, we'd rather have the nuisance taxes than these vampire taxes, <laughs> you know? You call them vampire so, taxes. <laughs> yeah, uh, because they're now going to the point of sucking the blood out of what runs the businesses. So we have to be careful about that. Not that we don't want to raise revenue. Yes, we do. But we should invest more in the productive areas and tax those areas. Uh, we cannot forever and ever keep to tax, keep taxing you know, small and medium scale businesses, which whose margins are already reduced because we all know it, the cost right. of doing business has gone high. Right. Fuel has gone high, energy has gone high, Everything has gone high. So what are the profit margins? Uh, this is not a political statement. It's a business statement. Because when you those transaction costs are high, it means their profits are reduced. And they are one of two choices. Either right. they reduce the staff, are you with me? Mm. But whatever they do, their profits will reduce. And when their profits reduce, what you're taxing is also reduced because you're taxing their profits. Right. So what you intend to get out of it and your projections of what you may get out of it will not be realized. And we've come to this point several times before. So I believe that the intention is good in the sense that we've woken up to a fundamental problem. That is government is too big for the size of the economy we have. Uh, we have one of two choices. Either we grow the economy rapidly and then we can afford to pay all these things or we begin making cuts. The third is that we do it simultaneously. And I would say that we go simultaneously, but m demonstrate some serious resolve to okay. make some of those cuts in their right. right places. Thank you for those initial thoughts. Let me bring in uh, Dr. John Osai Kwapong, a CDD fellow. Doc, uh, thank you for joining us via the phone lines. Uh, you, you just heard Dr. Abu Sakara uh, talk about the fact that, well, these are vampire taxes because they are sucking the very lifeblood out of businesses. For you, Looking at, you know, the, the 2023 budget from a global point of view, what would be your assessment of it? And do you agree that the Ghanaian, the ordinary Ghanaian person is being overtaxed or taxed right into the ground currently? All right, so we'll try to reconnect with Dr. John Osai Kwapong. He was with us a short while ago. We'll try to get the connection back on track. I just want to get his stake on this matter before we move on into other matters. But uh, Doc, Dr. Mantea, so just staying on the financial end, because I want us to wrap the conversation on that. Interestingly, we know that domestic bonds, at least from what Dr. John Kuma shared with us post the budget reading, that about 30% of that uh, is going to be shaved off. In fact, uh, incrementally, people are going to get their interest or returns. So in 2023, they'll get nothing. In 2024, 5%. In 2025, 10%. It's only in 2026 that these bondholders will get their returns uh, as it would have come to them under normal circumstances. 
How do you react to, to, to that? It, because it means they are getting a haircut for some four years. Any quick reactions? Uh, maybe I'm also bringing it in because it affects pensioners. Their coupons usually go here. And this means that pensioners, poor pensioners, are going to be affected. Quick takes for both you and Dr. Sakara before I bring in Dr. Kwako. Very much. I think Dr. Sakara made some salient points that I would like to pass a brief comment on, and I'll move on to your substantive question. Um, uh, you see, indeed, there's a certain level of recognition of, of, of you will find an attempt to deal with this uh, by uh, requiring that VAs are not used um, in towns and cities and the rest. But in terms of reducing the size of government, which for me is where the real problem is, where the real waste is, uh, we don't see any effort. Um, uh, government remains as big as it was before. Um, in fact, for me, it's not just about the number of ministers, but also uh, the number of uh, deputy CEO positions created in all the parastatal and, 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 and state-owned um, enterprises. In fact, some have as many as three deputy directors, newly created positions and all that. You go to some of the uh, agencies too, they've been overstaffed. I mean, with party people, party full soldiers and the rest. These create unnecessary expenditures. I mean, avoidable expenditures. And that is where, for me, we should be looking at if we want to cut waste from the system and not the cosmetic um, 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 approaches that we see in the budget. Now, can I move on to your substantive issue? Yes, please. Good. Um, it has to do with the, um, what we call the, um, what do you call it, um, haircut. Um, it's, it's rather unfortunate that um, we should go this route. Initially, when we, we heard rumors about a potential haircut, we had assurances from the ministry that it was not going to happen. Uh, and, and even at the time, people started withdrawing their investments. And so, in a situation where um, government has turned around to announce a 30% a, a haircut, that is going to undermine uh, public confidence in, in government instruments. And, and for me, that is a fear because a lot of the times the domestic market is the market of last resort. If you go out there, you're not able to raise, you come back to the domestic market. So if you undermine the confidence within the domestic market, then what it means is that people cannot trust you with their investments. And, and that, for me, will not bode well going forward for this economy. Right. Um, given the time frame that we have in the sunset clause of 2026, I can see for see many people recalling their investments um, and, and to avoid going through um, uh, this pain of, of losing substantial portion of their investment. And they will begin to look elsewhere to invest their money. Those who have not invested yet or those who took a precautionary measure of withdrawing their investments ahead of this announcement are going to look at other ways in which they can invest their money and get higher returns rather than investing in government bonds and other instruments. Interesting points you make there. Quick reaction, Dr. Sakara, very quickly, so I bring in Dr. Kwapong as well. Dr. Sakara, on that same point. Well, I, I think it, he's right. He's right on the spot there. Um, okay. You see, we've gone from a situation where people were afraid to have money uh, and then we came to a point where uh, it was liberalized and people started earning money and having money. Now they've started investing money. And we have a situation where you've decided you're going to share some of that money with them because you're, you're tight. And that is what is going to undermine the confidence of people because that confidence has been built up from a period where people were afraid to have money to a period now where people are comfortable having money and they're looking for investments. But I should say, in regard to your last point, which you were asking our other colleague, he was not here. The problem with the taxation is that because our economy is largely an informal one, what you're doing is actually taxing those people in the formal sector and squeezing them more. So it's not that all Ghanaians should not be taxed. Some of them should be taxed because they're not paying any tax at all. But if you can't get the money from those people, don't continue squeezing the people who you're getting the money from. That is the point I was making. John Osai Kwapong, uh, we lost you on the line a short while ago. Doc, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Good oh. to have you. 
so so okay. we're starting off the conversation talking about the economy. And of course, budget 2023 was read just a few days ago. What do you make of it in terms of taxation, VAT and e-levy and the dynamics? What do you make of it in terms of the bonds where we are looking at a haircut over the next four years? What do you make of it in terms of LEAP, for example, and the different dynamics? Is this going to help the ordinary Ghanaian? That's my question to you. Hello, Doc. D Dr. John Osaikwapon, can you hear me? It appears uh, we've lost Doc again. Dr. John Osaikwapong, a CDD fellow. He was going to share with us his thoughts on that uh, all-important matter. I think then we'll have to move the conversation forward and uh, maybe we can buy time to get Doc back if we could get that statement from the Lands and Natural Resources Ministry on using uh, gold to purchase oil. Maybe we'll start from there and uh, when we get Doc, we can take his his quick thoughts on the economy before we get to uh, that bit. So we'll just take a look at that statement uh, by the Chief Executive Officer, Minerals Commission, Accra, and addressed, actually, to the Chief Executive Officer, Minerals Commission, Accra, and the Managing Director, Precious Minerals Marketing Company, Diamond House, Accra. And it says, Dear CEO and MD, we'll bring it to you shortly on your screen, Directives to secure adequate quantities of gold to support the Gold for Oil program. Uh, it reads, I hope this reaches you in good health and spirits as part of measures by government to secure reliable and regular sources of affordable petroleum products for the Ghanaian market. Uh, government has developed a Gold for Oil program to purchase oil with gold produced in the country and ease the pressure on the Ghana city. This requires that government secures adequate quantities of gold to support the implementation of the program. Following several discussions, the economic management team of Ghana has agreed with the Bank of Ghana to, as part of its domestic gold purchase program, purchase a minimum amount of gold from gold mining companies in the country before any export of gold. To be able to achieve this objective and an exercise of government's preemptory right under Section 7 of the Minerals and Mining Act 2006, that is Act 703, and the powers, um, okay, so, and the powers conferred on the Minister responsible for mines by Section 101 of Act 703, the following directives are issued, and they are the following. One, effective 1st January 2023, all large-scale mining companies as agreed with the Bank of Ghana, shall shell 20% of all refined gold at their refineries to the Bank of Ghana in Ghana cities before the export of the gold. The Bank of Ghana and the Precious Minerals Marketing Company, that is the PMMC, will coordinate with the large-scale mining companies to ensure compliance with this directive. Now, two, <clears throat> effective 1st January 2023, all community mining schemes shall shell their gold outputs to government through the PMMC. All mining licenses for CMS shall include a clause mandating licenses to sell their gold output to government. That is a community mining scheme. Now three, effective 1st January 2023, all licensed small-scale gold miners shall shell their gold to government through the PMMC. All small-scale gold mining licenses shall include a clause mandating licensees to sell their gold to government. And finally, four, the gold to be purchased by the Bank of Ghana and the PMMC will be at spot price with no discounts. The Minerals Commission and the PMMC are requested to bring these directives to the attention of all gold mining companies, both large and small scale, and work with them to ensure compliance with these directives. And it's signed by the Sector Minister, Honorable Samuel Abu Janapur, Member of Parliament and Minister. Do we have Dr. Kwapon back on the line? All right, it appears we have a problem with that connection. So we'll go full steam ahead. Uh, Dr. Manteo, so moving the conversation forward, what do you make, first of all, when it comes to this directive, this policy direction, that we're going to use our gold to purchase oil? because of the fluctuation in, in our currency. 
Uh, the question has been asked, the gold prices are pretty stable globally over time, but there are times they take a dip. How will that affect our oil buying uh, prospects? And again, even if there are fluctuations in the currency and the price of oil goes up sharply, and if the price of gold is still down there, we'll still be having to cut our losses. And that is a statement on, on uh, what I just read, which we've already gone through. But what is your quick reaction to that, uh, to both of you gentlemen? I'll start with Dr. Mantea. Right. Um, uh, I'll say it, it's a good policy initiative. Although I think it, it was taken in, in a very sporadic manner. I mean, we could have put much more thought to it if the ob objective or the ultimate um, goal is to achieve more from our God-given mineral resources. And what this policy um, initiative means is that we are going to buy our own gold from the producers in situ. Right. Hello, Doc. Uh, please unmute again. It, it appears we've lost your connection. Intermittently, that happens. I don't know what is happening. Dr. Mateo. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Please go ahead. So we missed you yes. for about 30 seconds. Please go ahead. Yeah, so we're going to actually treat, um, buy our own gold in cities and then use that to trade for crude oil. So invariably, we'll be buying crude oil in cities. That, that's what it means. And then that reduces the pressure that is often brought to bear on the dollar, especially from the bulk oil, um, um, what do you call it, um, distributors who bring in the, the refined products. So it's a good initiative to the extent that it helps to manage our foreign exchange. Um, I have personally never understood um, why in the, in, in, in the cocoa sector, uh, the government takes absolute control over um, uh, uh, cocoa exports. Uh, and, 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 and in the mining sector, a vital sector of the national economy, right. we allow every Tom, Dick and Harry to be involved in the export of gold. Uh, that for me has denied this country a lot of the benefits and we've lost a lot of go through illegal exports. Right. I think time has come for us to control the way we manage our gold and how we export them. Okay, so you are, you are in full support of, of this initiative. The, the, history to, the history to this, uh, mm. part of it had to do, has to do with um, what you call institutional theft conflict between okay. um, um, the uh, Minerals Commission and PMMC the mineral, Precious Minerals Marketing Company. In fact, we did set up PMMC to be responsible for the purchases and export of our gold and diamond in, in this country. Mm -hmm. But at some point, uh, the Minerals Commission, who also has right to grant licenses for the purchases and export of gold, decided without consultation to the protest, uh, at the protest of the PMMC, to issue licenses to private entities to buy and export gold. So we lost control over our gold exports uh, within that context. Uh, and, and then subsequently, we assigned PMMC the sole responsibility for gold assaying, getting it to withdraw from the purchases of minerals. So now P, uh, PMMC has two main functions, um, gold assaying and also purchases of gold for the purposes of jewelry making for their, um, what do you call it, their uh, jewelry marketing activities. Right. And, 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 and so now that we've taken this decision, a question that we may need to answer is what happens to the private um, gold export licenses that we have issued to people? Because then they have a right to buy from the small scale sector. They have a right to buy from the community mining scheme. And now if you look at the directive, government is asking that mm -hmm. all these actors sell exclusively to PMMC so that we can have a certain control over our gold purchases and exports. So it creates a certain confusion. And I, I, I believe that the makers of this or the 
proponents of this directive didn't think really about it. There will be issues to address in terms of what happens to the private companies that also have licenses to buy and to export our, our mineral resources. Because so, right, right. if you take mm. directive, but, it covers the total production of the ASM sector and the total production of the community mining scheme. So what would the private people be buying? That, that's a good question you're posing. I just want a very, you know, straight to the point answer to this. Are you saying then that there are more um, cons to the pros of this? Or are you saying that by and large, it is a good thing, but with gray areas that we need to address? Of course, it can be improved. Um, I, 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 did, I did say that the fact that it targets the management of our forex, so invariably, like the point I made, We'll be buying crude oil with CDs because we are buying the gold in CD and using it to exchange for crude oil, which is priced in dollar. Right. That is good, a good initiative. But we can get much more from our gold if we are, we are minded to do so. And, and the point you made earlier about the volatility of, of gold prices. In fact, studies have shown that there is always an inverse relationship between gold prices and crude oil prices. So a lot of the times you'll find that when gold prices are going up, crude oil prices will be coming down. And when crude oil prices are going up, you find that gold prices will be coming down. There's this inverse relationship. So how you manage the volatility uh, of, of gold prices what becomes the biggest issue. And I think in this regard, we would have perhaps thought about a, a, a mineral revenue management framework, which allows you to build into it uh, a stability arrangement like we have in the oil sector, the stabilization fund, so that when you are able to rake in windfall, you put something aside against a rainy day. I mean, these are some of the areas that I think we, we can improve on if we want to optimize our benefits mm -hmm. from the gold sector. All right. Uh, let me bring in, uh, I'll come to you, Dr. Sakara, shortly, but let me bring in Suleimana Kone, uh, who joins us via the phone lines. He is CEO of the Chamber of uh, Mines. Doc, uh, Dr. Kone, thank you so much for joining the conversation. How are you? I'm very well. I hope you are too. Very well, thank you. Great. I know it's, it's, we've spoken about the PMMC and, and all the other parties involved in this, but as far as the Chamber of Mines is concerned, how do you react to this latest development? What is your appreciation of this gold for oil uh, situation? Dr. Manteo has just shared his concerns about it, what it would mean uh, in, in different aspects of that economy. What is your take? Well, um, we have not really sat down to actually analyze it, um, to have a, a change of position. Because, you know, the communication came out on Thursday, and we had a council meeting on Friday. We never had the opportunity to actually go through it. In any case, we've not had a formal communication from the Minerals Commission. As you would know, what went viral has a, a directive coming from our sector minister going to the Minerals Commission. And our expectation is that we'll have a follow-up competition and then you know, communication from the Minerals Commission. And then if there are any gray areas, we'll try and, and get some more clarity regarding how we are going to implement this program. However, ahead of this program, we as a chamber and our member companies, especially those producing gold, have had an arrangement under the domestic gold purchase program of the Bank of Ghana. My sense is that this is leveraging that program, which is started running this year. I think this was launched by the governor of the Bank of Ghana last year. And from, the, uh, from September to the end of this year, we, I remember companies have committed to sell 125,000 ounces to the Bank of Ghana. Um, the Bank of Ghana had intimated a target of about 220,000, but uh, looking at the requirements of our member company, they could only do about 125,000. Again, in that same request, we had a target of 600,000 for the year 2023. We're going through the motions of considering the ability of member companies to comply with this request. We have not even gone through that, that process completely. And then we, we also had that look. Um, in addition to this, we also have a goal uh, for, for oil program which we, we, we are not too sure what the, the final details would be. But I guess, given what we have been able to do with the Bank of Ghana, in terms of the agreement, the framework within which this would be done, probably it shouldn't be too much of a difficulty going through the, the same trade with the, uh, 
good for oil program, essentially because the, 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 the base or the foundation is, is practically the same thing, where you have mining companies you know, being paid in Ghana cities for the gold that they, they actually uh, would sell to the, to, to the Bank of Ghana. And, and the mining companies uh, have agreed to do this essentially because of the nature of the operation. Mining companies generally would, would uh, sell their mineral, mineral output um, for USD, and then after getting this USD, would have to return you know, a portion into the country to help them run the operation. So once you bring this you know, USD back into, into the country, there are two components of it. Some will remain in USD because some vendors would always need USD to be able to offer services to, to the mining industry. In fact, Bank of Ghana gives you know, authorization to some of these companies to, to receive their revenue by way of invoices they present to the mining companies, some 100% in USD, some 50% USD, and then 50% you know, local currency. All I'm saying is that mining companies have a need for Ghana cities at, at a point in time, and therefore it was not so much of a difficult the mining industry agreed with the Bank of Ghana to go along the, the request of, on the domestic gold purchase program. Well, that's an interesting take. So not enough has gone by in terms of discussions with you, but from where you sit, it's, it's going to be feasible, right? And it's going to inure to the benefit of the country, looking at the price vol volatilities that Dr. Manteau spoke of. In the end, bottom line, it will benefit us. Yeah, theoretically. Um, but as they Did you just say the theoretically? Yeah, yeah. Look, as they all would say, the devil is in the detail. We don't have too much detail. What we know is that the supply side, that is the mining industry making the gold available, you know, to, 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 to the Bank of Ghana, you know, for, for these transactions to, to be had. So, yes, it makes a lot of sense on paper, but we, we don't know the other side. What, what we know is what we have to be able to do with our, uh, our member companies with the Bank of Ghana, and that is a domestic gold purchase program, which I believe is being leveraged for the gold for, for oil program. What are some of the, just to wrap on, on this point, what are some of the ifs, the unknowns, the, the things on the other side that could hamper this deal and maybe not make it be as efficient as we would want it to be? Well, I, I don't want to go into detail, but the reality is that mining companies, when they bring the USD back into the country, it goes to commercial banks. Are we going to, to stifle the commercial bank with this arrangement? I don't know. I, mm. I don't have the full detail of, you know, the counterparties government is going to work with. The fine details, I, I would not be able to tell. So as far as the chamber is concerned, what we see is our ability to be able to transact with the Bank of Ghana, especially when the, the consumes required are reasonable, you know, in line with the, with the Ghana city requirements of our member companies. So that is where we, we, what we see as part of the equation. But the other side of it, we, we, don't, we don't have the full details. So, yes, our member companies won't do their best, their very best to really help our country in this difficult time. But I can't say for sure whether you know, we have the full grasp of the full details on the other side in terms of the counterparty you know, arrangement. So, yes, on paper, it makes a lot of sense. You know, but we don't have the full details. So, as far as we are concerned, we are looking at the supply side. And, and the constraints around it is what are your city requirements? And, and is this arrangement consistent with what your city requirements are? Uh, Dr. Kone, just hold for me uh, there. Later, I want to come back to you about, you know, the involvement of community mining and, and, and all of that. But let me also come into the studio. It's interesting. We have uh, Dr. Stephen Blessing Aka uh, of the Gold Expo, right? And uh, he joins the conversation as well. But, but tell me, this is interesting. You're almost a prophet in, in this because sometime last year, you had discussions surrounding our balance of payment and all of that. And you brought up this very issue, not, not just specifically to do with oil or crude, but you said to deal with our bal balance of payment issues, we could purchase some of the gold locally. Now we're being told it will be purchased in Ghana cities and then use that as a sort of barter. Why, why did you come forth with that thought in the first place? Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Suleiman, my boss. <laughs> 
Yes, yeah, so I think that the country is trying to use their competitive advantage of minerals as a store of value, which of right. course is good, um, to run this initiative. However, we hope that the ASM, um, I won't talk about the last scale because I have Mr. Suleiman on. My concern will have to do with the small scale and the community mining. And we hope that the ASM, the community mining miners, do become heretic to such initiative. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because um, of the baseline conditions that will automatically affect some of these programs. Um, we, the country is, doesn't have an LBMA refinery yet. Um, the minister sent this um, you know, communique on Thursday, which is good. However, we have to look at the baseline conditions on governance, uh, social and environmental. For the past four years, we've been battling with irresponsible mining, galamse issues and this. Um, once such initiative come up, we have to look at the framework. I think for us as a uh, policy entity, we've been advocating that the Bank of Ghana should buy gold, not just buying, but to reserve gold and have the optimization uh, program, which I think Bank of Ghana started last year. So right. this is more of a new program that is coming up, and we have to be very careful to look at the framework aspect of it so that it doesn't turn out to be the cocoa issue whereby they say there's a band on uh, Ghana's cocoa. So this is where we are coming from. Also, you also have to understand that majority of the ASM in Ghana don't have the fiscal money. No commercial banks in Ghana gives money to ASM to mine gold. It means they go outside to raise money by themselves. So if um, a miner goes to maybe Dubai to get money to mine gold, and now government says they should sell gold directly to the central bank, there was going to be the benefit of the investor who is giving money. So these are some of the issues that we are trying to raise. In other money. words, you're saying that directive doesn't endure to the benefit of the person who is going out there to source his own funds or the entity yeah. going out there to source their own funds and come and do mining here. Yeah. Are you saying government doesn't have a right to do that? Because when okay. you look at what, what, what has been put out by the lands ministry, uh, they would quote some sections of the law and say that this is per the law and that is what must be done. Let me just find some of them. And then, yeah, so, so to be able to achieve this objective and an exercise of government's preemptory right under Section 7 of the Minerals and Mining Act 2006, that is Act 703, and the powers conferred on the minister responsible for mines by Section 101 of Act 703, before they go on to elaborate. Yes, but um, uh, thank you very much. But you know, the community mining is clearly stated that it's been owned by local or indigenous people. We mm. understand that. The ASM, which is a small-scale miner, is not under the community mining program. Mm. So as you remember, Dr. Manto already raised the concern that what of if PMMC is uh, issuing licenses to private entity who are supposed to export gold? What I'm trying to say is that um, no um, small-scale miner can sell directly the whole output to the central bank. Maybe we should, we should reconsider that. If maybe 50% should be sold, it's fine, because at the end of the day, Unless maybe the government is making a financial arrangement with the commercial banks so that the commercial bank begins to look at the gold trade. You know, usually for us as, as a country, we've been looking at the mining of gold, not actually the trading aspect of it. Right. So if government is putting such initiative, that means we have to quickly expand the program because um, Mr. Suleiman mentioned something very important. The domestic purchase program is something that we've been advocating for and we are, we've not yet seen the success of it. And then, because it just started last year. This is a new program that is coming up. So I feel that the government should uh, look into more of the domestic purchase program, whereby the central bank have the right, the first right of refusal, to purchase gold. That one is clear. So it means that government should look at the aggregators, those that are doing mining responsibly, then you can look at the base condition, then onboard them. Then as it goes on, people that feel that, oh, once for example, you say gold should be purchased in a spot, so automatically it, purchases, it benefits the local miner here. So of course, the local miner would like to be part of it and also ensure that it's a way to avoid people doing galamse because you are going to put up the, the baseline condition and the international requirement that allow you to mine responsibly will automatically be in place. But if we are just to jump from the domestic purchase program, this we don't have much details about this so it's going to be of much um, uh, an issue so i think the ministry should quickly put a stakeholder meeting together right 
And, and, and more consultation is needed, yeah. just as uh, Dr. Kone was mentioning. But then it appears when it comes to community mining schemes, it, it appears all of what you produce should, should go to the, the yes. central bank. That, or, is, that is what, that, that's what the minister have said. But mm. at the end of the day, um, we, we, we want to be sure to see who or which of the community mining at the moment has their full local support. Because government have purchased, have supported with the zero micro machines. There are other investment that has to. So I think government, well, the first thing, even uh, this is a good initiative, but government should look at how do we finance the community mining programs? How do you have, because until you So, so if government it, were to maybe fully finance your activities, then you would say, okay, yeah. if you're fully financing, then you can get this and yeah. we, we, we both benefit from the proceeds, exactly. right? Exactly. But, exactly. but in this instance, as it stands now, it says all mining licenses for community mining schemes shall include a, cause, uh, a clause mandating licensees to sell their gold output to government. That is not already in existence, right? It's it already, it, it already in for the community mining. It's already in for yes, the community but mining. But the question is, no, who community mining have sold gold to Central Bank of Ghana? Right. There's no community that have sold gold. That's what I'm saying. That so, so now they are triggering that. They yeah. are triggering that yes. clause. Yes, you can only do that. You see that we have to we have to be clear with it. Their framework one has to do the financing aspect. The other aspect have to look at the industry requirement on how to mine responsibly. We have to be sure to do the checks and balance to ensure that the community miner in Western Region is mining responsibly. There's a traceability. You cannot just pick gold from maybe my hometown in Zama and get sell go to the central bank. The central bank can never keep that in their records because the gold is not responsibly mined. So we have to look at this, all this framework so that once you put them in place, that is why, because even if I finance you and I can't trace the gold where I'm buying the gold, of course, it's not going to, the central bank can never announce that. That's why at first we thought that one of the easiest way will be the last K company because they have the LBMA support, they'll be able to sell part of their gold to the central bank so the central bank can build out the reserve and also have that as a hedging because i think the government should look at where they build a proper optimization and a hedging platform so that that can be used for the gold right but the minister coming down to talk about the community money in the asm we need to have the responsible money framework once we have that then we can now onboard um, this uh, community miners in the ASM, so that they can also be part of the program. A responsible mining framework, an RMF, yes. If, yes. If, if I could put it that way. Uh, before I take your final thoughts, gentlemen, let me have the takes of uh, Dr. John Osai Kwapong together with Dr. Abu Sakara. You've not had a take on this. I'll start with you, Dr. Kwapong. What do you make of this endeavor? All right, so, so let's, let's go to Dr. Sakara. What do you make of this endeavor? What are the, the pluses and minuses? And looking at all the concerns that have been raised, should we start implementing this now or should we wait till we have everything intact? We already know that the, the central bank has been purchasing gold from some of these other entities. Should we take a chill pill when it comes to the community mining scheme? What's your take? Policy reflects a lot of what is wrong with policy making, which is always a knee-jerk reaction to problems when they arise, rather than a planned out comprehensive policy framework within which a principle is observed. The principle being observed here is that one, unlike cocoa, which is grown at will, because you can choose not to grow cocoa, gold already exists in the soil and it is a property of all Ghanaians. That's the principle at stake. The next issue is that gold being a currency in its own right, you cannot have a situation where the second biggest producer of gold in the world has the weakest currency in the world. Th that's just a contradiction. So you have to bridge these two issues. All these attempts to sell the gold to the central bank, etc., is just really to show up our currency. And if that is what you want to do in principle, then simply install a gold refinery here. And all gold, whether small or big commercial producers, is refined here. It cannot be taken out of the country unless it's refined. It meets international standards. And it's traded from here. It's as simple as that. Then you will have the backing of your currency that you need to have. So if we want to address this issue, let's address it comprehensively. 
And let's go to a historical fact. Up till today, Mansa of Muras Musa of Mali is rated as the richest man in the world. Why? Because nobody could take any gold out of Mali. It all came to a central point and it was traded from there. And that is what made Mali the richest country in the world. Now, we are in a situation where there is a contradiction and we have to address that contradiction and work through the uh, policy with the industry players. And I, the ideas being brought forth by uh, the industry players, they are, are on point and we should work with them uh, to do that. It should not be just to address a temporary situation and then when things are normal again, we let go of it and we go back to what we used to do. How is it that Rwanda, of no history of gold production, has a gold refinery? Mm. And we in Ghana here, who have a long history of gold production, have no refinery. How difficult is that? So some of these issues, you know, if you don't address the, 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 the problem at a fundamental level based on principle, you will just keep redressing and redressing the symptoms and to keep going round and round and coming back again. So I go for the, uh, for the, for the, for the uh, initiative in as far as it can be expanded and made comprehensive right. to adhere to certain fundamental rights. The gold is a, a finite resource. It was there in the first place. It belongs to us. If developing countries had this goal, they wouldn't be managing it in the way we are. Yeah. And since it belongs to all of us and it's a finite resource, we must manage it in such a way that it benefits generations across the board. Okay. Those now and those yet unborn. So, so quickly, and let, also, mm, so, so quickly, let me let me just ask for what do you think can be done uh, in, in just some 30 seconds to regulate this and ensure that moving forward, we get the best out of this this deal because it is clear government is going to follow through on this but how do we optimize it i think the first thing is to be consistent uh you cannot have one rule for the small scale miners and another rule for the large scale miners it will be difficult to implement your 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 industry person was alluding to a certain fact which he didn't want to come out and say clearly which is that the supply may mitigate the policy itself. In other words, the policy can be there, but if you're not getting any supply, what good is it to you? And already we know that even now, what we officially put out as gold that has been produced in this country is a fraction of what it actually is, right. both in respect to the figures in India and with respect to the figures in Dubai. So, yes, it has to be a comprehensive plan, but let's put a refinery here First of all, let's get the plan comprehensive so everybody is being treated the same. Let's make the investments that we need to ensure that it is indeed tradable and then work on the trading side and gradually as we get stronger and okay. we put in a refinery, create a trading floor here for gold. Okay. And that's the end of it. Doc, we're grateful for those uh, final thoughts. Dr. Abu Sakara Foster is with the National Interest Movement. Let me let me uh, bring in uh, Dr. Corney. Are you still with us? Can you I hear am me? with you. Great. For you, having had this very expansive conversation, what do you think is the way forward? F further discussion, I guess, because, like you said, there's not been enough of that. But what else ought to be done? I, th I think we, we need to have, and I agree with uh, Dr. Sakara, it has to be quite expansive and comprehensive. How do we take advantage of the gold resources, the mineral resources we have in this country. Um, I'm also having better retention of the value of mining within the country, and it has to be across the board. What we are discussing is a fraction of it, and we ourselves as a chamber, one of the strategies we are thinking about, how do we work with various stakeholders, including government, to retain a large part of their value. And here, I'm not just talking about the, the quantum or the monetary value, but the whole value, including local content, you know, training of our own people to occupy important goods and so on and so forth within the country. And this is just a small part of it. So we need to have that comprehensive conversation. I think your listeners need to understand 
that as we speak, we have two refineries in the country. What is lacking is the LBM certification. So we need to work together to make sure that we attain that LBM certification, which is the minimum requirement for large-scale responsible mining companies to transact uh, within a particular refinery. So that is key. I know the government is also keen to have this done as soon as possible. And I know a committee was set up a while ago, hoping that this committee would be able to work with various parties so that we can expedite action in getting this in that. So a number of things are being done behind the scenes, but we need to pull everything together so that where we believe we should be as a country, leveraging our mineral resources, we should be able to get there in the shortest possible time. Let me ask you an interesting question, just to cap it off. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, when you look at feasibility from what you've seen over time, how feasible is this scheme? Where one is the least or zero is the least and 10 is the highest? How feasible, how practical is it for you? Like I said, I don't have the other side. The, the one, the side I know about the supply side. Yes, with, with, supply with what you side. know as of now, because you don't have all the other facets, with what you know as of now, what would be your assessment? Probably five. Five out of 10? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kone, for... Uh, your time with us this morning. He is CEO, Chamber of Mines. Dr. Manteo, you followed the conversation. What is your take to conclude? I think what we need is policy harmonization. Um, if you look at this particular directive mm. and compare it with what we have in the MIP Act. Hello, Doc. It appears we, we have some more challenges with uh, Dr. Manteo's connection. Uh, Doc, can you just uh, unmute for us and, and maybe just start afresh? If, if you can hear me, Doc, uh, unmute and am I, start. Am I back? Yes, you're back. Please go ahead. Yeah, there's a certain level of inconsistency between what you have in the MIF Act and then this directive. The MIF Act seeks to uh, uh, to address the issue of what you call forward linkage or beneficiation, which means to move us to a point where Ghana will not be exporting gold bars, but jewelry, which has higher value in terms of returns. Right. Now, this particular directive seeks to entrench us in the export of um, what you call gold bars and not jewelry, because we are going to ship gold bars to go and pay for crude oil. Therefore, we lose the opportunity of beneficiation. And when we lose the, the, the benefit of beneficiation, the consequence is that you also lose opportunities for job creation. Because through jewelry making, you'll be creating jobs. As you create jobs, you'll be creating additional tax opportunities, corporate income tax from the jewelry manufacturing companies, and also personal income tax from the workers. And then you also increase your export, export value because you are not shipping just gold bars, but you are shipping Jewelry and the MIF Act recognizes this value addition and what it can do for the economy. But then here, here we are. We have a directive that seeks to emphasize the shipment of gold bars. So there is a certain level of inconsistency and requires some policy harmonization going forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Steve Manteo, uh, formerly with the PIAC and uh, a very able resource person on this matter. We are grateful for your time, sir. Let me conclude in the studio with uh, Dr. Stephen Blessing Aka. So you've heard the comments of everybody. I think I'll throw it to you as well. Your assessment so far, it's been said that we shouldn't have different, you know, operating systems for community mining versus the other schemes when it comes to mining, large scale uh, mining. But as you see it now with what you know for now, in terms of practicality, in terms of feasibility, how would you assess this, this policy on a scale of 1 to 10? Well, uh, it's too early yet, but I think um, it's part of the, uh, if web uh, implemented, it's going to be part of the um, optimization program by the central bank, mm. which is good. However, um, as I mentioned, it would be good to have the, um, the verification protocol to assess the performance of the community mining scheme and also the private ASM miners in Ghana. Mm. Once we have the output and we also ensure that they are mining responsibly, that is where we can come out to believe that the program is going to work. Because I don't think government is only going to depend 
on the large scale output. That is why the minister inserted in that the community mining and the small scale. But the, the, these indigenous people who produce gold have a lot of issues. That has to do with the entire framework. So we are asking government to look at where um, go the, 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 the entire supply chain of gold from the mining side to the end user. So that's what we are more keen into it. And I think once the government look at that, we'll be able to have this program successfully. And it's going to benefit the miner because uh, we are, we, the, the miners are happy to hear that gold is going to be sold at a, um, at a spot price. However, there are a lot of issues that government should look at. So I'll read government by maybe five or six. Five or six, sticking with what Dr. Kone said. Yeah. And you've also spoken about funding yeah. for you, which will be a key determinant in, in how you can feed into the scheme. Exactly. We're grateful, uh, Dr. Stephen Blessingaka, for joining the conversation. And we can only pray that as it moves on, some of these little details are attention is paid to them and that it will work for all of us. Because you proposed it last year, now it has come. But the dynamics of it is the problem. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. All right. So we've had quite a conversation uh, here this morning on the gold for oil situation as well as the budget. But when we return, and I'll be sharing with you some thoughts uh, uh, shortly, when we return, we're going to have quite an interesting conversation. In fact, before I announce it, let me just uh, let you know that you can buy three months or 12 months HD Plus subscription on your HD Plus decoder this football season. All you have to do, dial star 844 star 8 hash, star 844 star 8 hash to enter the HD Plus or Recordo double double promo. There are 1,700 rewards to be won, including trips for three couples to Dubai in December. I could do with that. 65-inch TVs, household appliances, etc. This promotion is valid from now till the 5th of December, 2022. Having said that, up next, right after the break, I'll be interacting with a person who was chair of that committee put together to put up or put together Weave the 1992 Constitution of Ghana, that group of experts. He also was the very first board chairman of the PURC. In fact, he has worked with the United Nations, the World Bank, myriad organizations, and he also is a traditional ruler. He has engaged people in the past who have become presidents. Of whom am I speaking? Maybe to give you a fair idea. He's the paramount chief of Asokori Mampong. He's been that for over two decades. Still don't know? Well, after the break, you'll know. You'll find out. Stay with us.